Well, last week we kicked off our Christmas series with an awkward family Christmas. W- wasn't it good? I mean, the, the worship was amazing. Junior knocked the sermon out of the park. Uh, it, wasn't it awesome? A good first week? Yeah, you guys can, you guys can clap. I feel like we need to get awake a little bit. If you feel like you missed out, well, you shouldn't skip church, and so you've learned a valuable lesson. Uh, we, we, do, we still love you, and you can go catch what you missed on the Bridge app. But one thing you didn't miss was Junior uh, throwing up this awkward family picture of me, <laughs> and I, I, I just have to be clear. I got to set the record straight because I've actually had people come up to me this week, and they asked if this was real. There's nothing, listen to me, nothing about this picture is real, okay? This is called Junior Found Photoshop. And people have been asking me, Jordan, oh, well, you're preaching this weekend. What are you going to do? Get him? Like, how are you going to get him back? This is your moment. You got to get him. And you want to know what? Um, I've grown a lot this year. Okay, this is petty retaliation. That's beneath me. And so we're just going to move on, and I'm going to let him feel bad. Okay, so I want you to turn into your Bibles to Mark chapter 2 and... Oh, my, oh, how did that get up there? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Okay, uh, <laughs> Nicole, this should, Nicole's in the room. This should concern you. I didn't even Photoshop this one, okay? <laughs> All right, actually turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter two. Oh, uh, if, if you are turning there, if you don't have a Bible, there's blue Bibles in the chairs in front of you. I wanna encourage you, take a Bible out. I, I would love for you to actually be able to thumb through the words of God for yourself. One thing I have noticed as your campus pastor is before COVID, there was a little bit more Bibles turning, there's a little bit more people taking notes. Uh, and so I would love for us just, just to get back to that. I, I'm not gonna put a lot of these verses up on the screen because I want you to be able to see them and follow along. The, this book is our authority. This is what we stand on, and we have to take this so seriously. So as you're looking that up, let me pray. Father, uh, this whole time, it is for you. Uh, This is our worship to you. We we come, we sing to you, but then we also humble our hearts. We open our minds in order to just to hear and say, God, what do you want for us? How do you want our lives to look? How do you want us to live? How do you want us to to be like you to the world? And so God, I do, I, I really pray that you teach us that your Holy Spirit's here working loud. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, at the start of this chapter that we're in, Mark chapter two, it says that the word spread that Jesus was back home in Capernaum. He's back home in Capernaum, which is weird because if you know anything about Jesus, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but then he grew up in Nazareth, which is about 40 40 miles away from his hometown. And he says he's in Capernaum, though. And it's this little fishing town This is where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. This is where he did a a lot of his miracles and teachings and healings. So so much that the people said, actually, Capernaum, this is the home of Jesus. And so when Jesus came back to Capernaum, news spread fast. People from all over the area, they'd come to hear him teach. They'd bring their sick to him. They'd want to see a miracle. They may have even secretly hoped that they'd be chosen by Jesus to be one of his disciples because word on the street was that Jesus was picking his tribe. And word on the street was he was taking just about anybody because his first round draft picks were a couple of young dudes with scruffy faces, callous hands, and they just reeked of sushi. I mean, it, it, was, it was so weird, nobody understood it. This rabbi was picking fishermen. Rabbis didn't do that. Rabbis always had this sharp entourage. They had A-plus students with soft hands and smooth faces and a pious attitude. If you were a rabbi, choosing your protege, that that was everything. That was a big deal. And Jesus seems like he's scraping the bottle of the barrel today. And today, we're gonna show you that he's actually going to add to this crew, and it's going to get a little bit awkward. You ready for it? Look down in verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. Again, the crowds are flocking to Jesus. You gotta hear this guy. You won't believe it. I mean, he speaks with such clarity, with such power, authority when he teaches. And after Jesus was teaching, he started to walk further up the shore. Look at verse 14. As he soon passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, more commonly referred to now as Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to Matthew, follow me. And he rose and followed him. 
Okay, this right here is where a lot of first century readers would have closed the book. Like, they're like, nope, I'm done. This, this is a terrible story. This story's garbage. I'm not finishing this because the main character just chose a tax collector to be part of his team. Like, no way, that's not happening. Don't, don't miss the shock here. This interaction is one of those moments where I bet Jesus would have lost a lot of his followers. And Jesus knew it. He knew by choosing this guy that his approval rating was going to plummet. Because this is just something you don't do. You don't approach a guy like this. You don't even associate yourself with him, let alone invite him into your circle. You want to know the reason why? It's because this guy works for the government. He works for the IRS. Which is, we know, this is like all of our favorite thing to complain about. But back then, they actually even had more of a right to complain. In order to give you just a sense of how awkward this is, we have to take a trip to Capernaum. And we have to understand what's really going on. And so for all of you who have been writing in through emails and cards asking, Jordan, when do we get to hear about roaming taxation? Please, 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 please. Well, Merry Christmas. (laughs) This is your moment. At this time in history, the Roman Empire, it's ginormous. Uh, All the way from what you know is Spain all the way to India is what the Roman Empire ruled. I mean, they uh, they owned it all. And the only way to own all of that, well, you know it, it's through power and it's through money. And so Rome was creative. They said, you know what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use your people to get your money from you to us. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, Canada has just invaded us. I know. This is obviously a fictional story because let's be real, it's Canada. But for the illustration, let's just say the Mounties mounted up, they came down, they smothered us in maple syrup, and they just took over. Okay? Now we're all under Canada's rule. Everyone has to now play like ice hockey and listen to Justin Bieber. Okay? That's, that's, our, that's our punishment. Now, Problem is, is that Canada puts that number out to, so this is what they do. Canada, they don't have the the manpower to force us all to pay taxes. And so Canada, what they do is they look up all of our counties and they kind of divide up and they say, okay, this county can give us this much money, this county will give us this much money. So they'd look at Cook County and they'd come up with a number. We'll say 50 million. 50 million, Cook, Cook County owes us 50 million. And so Canada, they puts that number out to bid. And the wealthy in our country, so the guys who are already rich, would bid to collect it. They say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll do 51 million. I'll do 53. I'll collect 61. No, 67 million sold. And then we're sitting at home going, whoa, 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 whoa. It was 50 million, and someone bid it up to 67 million? Like, we already owed them 50 million, and now one of our fellow Americans, who's already rich, mind you, living in Cook County, he just hiked it up to 67 million to make more money for himself. That guy's a traitor, isn't he? Like, Canada then now gives said traitor a bunch of Mounties to go collect the money, and any extra that this guy wants to collect, he gets to collect and keep for himself. So not only does he bid up our taxes, now he's using foreign soldiers to get us to pay up. And he's collecting more in order to kind of put more additions onto his house and live an even better life. I mean, we would hate this guy, wouldn't we? And this is Matthew. He's of Jewish descent. He grew up a Jewish boy with Jewish friends, but he's no longer considered a Jew by his people. He's now a traitor. He's now a traitor who extorts and oppresses his own people with the help of foreign soldiers. Matthew's hated, he's ostracized, he's excommunicated, and I don't know about you, but I I get it. I understand. And so there he is in verse 14. He's sitting at his booth. He's collecting his dirty money, getting richer as the locals are living hand to mouth. And what does it say? It says that Jesus sees him. It says that Jesus notice him, he pays attention to him, and he starts to walk towards the booth. Everyone watching, they're getting kind of excited, right? They're like, hey, Jesus is Jewish. He's on our team. Je- Jesus loves, lo- loves Israel. Je- Jesus loves the people. Jesus is about to go off. He's gonna come. He's gonna start flipping tables. He's gonna start freaking out. This is gonna be, everyone watching is getting excited. 
And he says, here we go. Everyone watch this. Hey, Levi. And the chatter stops. Dead silence. You could hear a pin drop. Hey, Levi. Follow me. Two words every Jewish boy wanted to hear. Two words that only good Jewish boys would hear. Two words that would have never been used towards a sellout like Matthew. And yet Jesus has the nerve to say it. I'm sure right away in this moment, most people would have thought, you know what, I knew it. I knew it about this Jesus guy. He's not about the Torah. You know what Jesus is about? He's about the money. He wants to get rich like Matthew. There's, there's so many parts of Jesus that fascinate me. This is one of them. I mean, we, we live in a day and age where people will do whatever they can to build their platform. You've seen it, haven't you? Gain, I just gotta gain more followers. I gotta get more likes. I gotta grow my audience. And I understand it. Like they, people wanna have a big impact on the world and I get that. But the danger is that pastors can often take shortcuts in order to appease the majority. Maybe you've seen that before. Maybe they say something in which will get them more followers. Maybe they don't say something in order so they don't lose and offend their followers. But anyone here in leadership and who has influence, it's so easy to be all about your own platform. And that's a dangerous trap that that anyone could fall into. But if you look at Jesus' ministry, Jesus' platform, it grew. He, He was smart about it. He was intentional about it. When he would go into a new area, he'd spread the word. Hey, I'm coming. You go tell people, bring a crowd, and the crowd would come. But here's the main difference. Jesus was never afraid to lose them. He was never afraid to lose them. And it actually happened quite a bit. And it's, and it's happening here. His follower, his follower numbers on his social media, they were, they were just plummeted. They, they tanked. And he, he just made things incredibly awkward. See, Matthew, he gathers his things. Matthew files his scrolls. He closed down his booth. And he walks over to Jesus' disciples, who, who, who were struggling not to just to punch Matthew right in the mouth. Because remember, where are we? We're still in Capernaum. The fishermen are from Capernaum. Matthew is from Capernaum. Who are these tax collector, or these fishermen's tax collectors? Matthew, right? Matthew wasn't, or fishing wasn't just this tax-exempt enterprise. So Jesus' disciples, they grew up having to pay taxes on everything they caught and sold. And Matthew was the guy that they've been paying. Matthew was the guy who probably was charging them a little bit too much. Matthew was the guy that many of these disciples have been trying to evade for the last decade. And voila, here he is. Yesterday, these fishermen, they they probably felt proud as they walked through town with Jesus, right? They're like, hey, look at us. A rabbi chose us fishermen. Today, they're probably walking with their heads down through the city because their rabbi now just chose the scum of the town. This is awkward. Okay, Jordan, uh, this isn't a very festive story, okay? Like, how is this going to help me with my gatherings this Christmas? How is this gonna help me in this season? And I just wanna warn you, because it is, but you're going to hate the answer. But this is the reality. What did Jesus do here? What, what, What is Jesus doing here? Well, he's doing exactly what you need to do with your gatherings this season. Number one, this is in your notes. You got to walk towards the awkward. I heard some groans there. (laughs) You got to walk towards the awkward. Go back to verse 14. It says that Jesus saw Matthew. He noticed him. And then he went over to talk. We all in our lives, we we have a Matthew somewhere in our life. It's either in our family. It's in your extended family. It's in your office, office. Somewhere you have a Matthew. And sure, maybe they're not a, a national trader. Maybe they're just a, a, a family trader. Or maybe they're a friend who betrayed you. Or maybe even just calling them a traitor is extreme. But they've definitely hurt you, haven't they? They did that thing. They forgot that thing. They said that thing. And the worst part is they meant it. They knew what they said one right when they said it. And now when you see them, it's just awkward. Did you have someone like that in your life? Their political ideology is all messed up. They went behind your back. They get attention at your expense. Their talk is just off-putting. They're kind of annoying. They're inconsiderate. They're loud. They're super opinionated. They're weird. And so your response is naturally, well, I'm just going to evade them. Right? I'm just going to kind of avoid them. 
I'm gonna stay away. I'm gonna stay in the other room. I'm gonna make sure that we don't really cross paths together. Minimal talking. I'm just going to survive the awkwardness. That's how most of us deal with the awkward. We just avoid it. You need to have that awkward conversation with your spouse or with your kids. And you say, ah, you know what? That's a sore subject. I don't wanna get involved in all the drama. We're just gonna put it on the back burner. And slowly your family deteriorates because you lack the courage to lead. Something's up with your coworker. Ah, you know what? Again, I don't want to get into the drama. I'm just going to mind my own business. Maybe your extended family's all over the place. And you say, babe, you know what? Your family's crazy. Can we just do like another Zoom Christmas? Because that was awesome. I had to sign in for like 10 minutes and that was it. I mean, you and me, we naturally try to avoid the awkward. But Jesus walked towards it. And following Jesus means that we are called to walk towards it as well. Making a difference in the world, it means dealing with the awkward. For those of you who want to make any kind of difference in the world, you're going to have to walk towards the awkward. Our staff uh, at church here, we have staff values. We talk about them all the time in staff meeting, and we take these, these seriously. Each one of us uh, at staff, we have these, these values framed. They're on our desk. They're on our shelf somewhere. There's mine right on my shelf. And one of these values that we have and that we talk about is walk towards the mess. This is a big staff value. We, we repeat this all the time. Walk towards the mess. And we repeat it a lot because, frankly, you all are a mess. Okay? Someone laughed. That was, that was kind of a joke, okay? Uh, listen, we, we repeat this because this is one we don't naturally want to do. I, listen, I, I'm just being honest. I, don't, I would rather walk away from the family who's dealing with their child's gender identity. Like, that's messy. I'd rather walk away. I would rather walk away from that couple getting a, a divorce. I would rather walk away from the guy who comes into church drunk. I would. I, I would rather not get involved in that. And I know it's my sin, but it's true. Walking away, it's less difficult. It's less drama. It's less pain. But you want to know what else? It's also less impact. It's less help. And walking away is less like Jesus. The reality is nobody has ever made a difference avoiding the awkward. No one's ever done anything of significance by avoiding that person or by avoiding that situation. You were put here in life not to just avoid. You were put there where you are to walk towards the awkward and make a difference. Take a look at scripture. Those who made the biggest difference were those who walked towards the awkward. So the good Samaritan, he walked towards the bleeding guy in the road. Uh, Moses walked towards Egypt, towards the place that kept his people in slavery. Little David, with his rocks and sling, he walked towards the battlefield, towards Goliath. Jesus, he walked towards the woman at the well. Jesus walked towards the demon-possessed man. Jesus walked toward the lepers. Luke writes that when Jesus knew his time had come, you know what he did? He walked towards Jerusalem. He walked towards the cross. Over and over and over, scripture shows people walking towards messes in order to make a difference. If you look, even just in your own life, think about it. Think about the people who have made the biggest difference in your own life. Those are the people who walk towards your mess, aren't they? Those are the people who saw garbage and junk going on and they said, hey, it, 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 was, it would have been easier for them not to get involved, but they instead they looked at everything you're going through and they said, no, 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 I'm gonna walk towards that. I'm gonna walk towards you and I'm not going to judge you for it. I'm not going to shame you for it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit in it with you. I'm gonna help you and I wanna to try to guide you to something better. The best small group leaders, the best leaders of their families, the best parents, the best friends are those who enter into the awkward, not because they want to, but because they know it can make a world of a difference. If you want a healthy marriage, you want a healthy family, you have to walk towards the awkward. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to go towards the awkward. If you're going to make a difference in this world, we have to be people that go right towards the mess because Jesus walked towards a sellout, a traitor, a mess. And he did something amazing with Matthew's life. But first, he did something even crazier. Look down at your Bibles, look at verse 15. And it said, and as he reclined at the table at his house, which is crazy, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. 
All right, put yourself there. Tran- transport yourself into this awkward, old, tiny little room where they're all eating. It's, it's one of the, the fancier houses in Capernaum because it's a tax collector's house. It, it, it's bigger, it's well protected, it's, it's gotta be. And the disciples, they're there eating. They gotta be annoyed. They don't wanna be there. Right? They're probably looking around at all the nice paintings. They're looking at all the imported rugs. And all they're thinking is, man, look at what all my family's hard work has paid for in your house. And there they, they sat down, not just with Matthew, which that would have been bad enough, but they sit down and have a dinner party with all of Matthew's other rich, corrupt buddies. And there's Jesus right in the middle of the action, right in the middle of the mess. Jesus not only saw Matthew, not only did he tell Matthew, hey, come and follow me, Jesus entered into his life, he entered into his house, he sat at his table, and he tries to enter into his world as he tries to take an interest in these men. Listen here, if you want to embrace the awkward, there's something that you have to do. If you want to be honestly someone that that changes and helps people's lives, you have to take an interest. You have to take an interest in those people. You notice this in scripture, people who were like Jesus, they were nothing, or people who were nothing like Jesus, have you noticed this? They were like Jesus. Isn't that interesting? People who were nothing like Jesus, they actually liked Jesus. So at this table, you have uneducated fishermen. Jesus was very educated. At this table, you have greedy tax collectors. Jesus was very generous. At this table, you have notorious sinners, and yet they're sitting and laughing with the sinless God. People who were nothing like Jesus actually liked Jesus. Why? I would guess because Jesus was really good at taking an interest in people. People knew that even though he didn't agree with them, Jesus still cared about them. Can the people in your life say the same? Hey, man, I know these people think so differently when it comes to the vaccine or when it comes to COVID or when it comes to politics. Yet, you know what? I still know more than anything, they love me to death. They care about me. They'd go to bat for me. They have my back. Do the awkward people in your life, do they know that? See, if this season's going to be different for you, if you, if you want to make a difference in other people's lives, you got to learn to genuinely care about them. It's that famous Max, or John Maxwell quote. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, you can shout on your bullhorn repeatedly or to repent all day long, but if that person doesn't know that you care about them, it's not going to make a hair of a difference. It doesn't matter. Screaming information at people, that's easy. Entering into the mess and taking a genuine interest, well, that, that's, that's hard. That's difficult, but it's way more impactful. Especially because for most of us, taking an interest in other people is just not natural. What's natural is for us to walk into a room and want people to get interested in us. That's natural. That's why some of your Christmas gatherings are like these big competition fests. Right? You dress up nice, you try to tell your best and most interesting stories, you, you put on this little act like you got everything all figured out, and now it's picture perfect, little Christmas cards, and because you want people leaving thinking, wow, this, this, this guy's got it going on, right? This girl's got her stuff together. But when Jesus came, he completely flipped the script. He went into rooms with the intent of taking a genuine interest in those that he wanted to make the biggest difference in. And that needs to be our heartbeat as well. Listen, that is why people who were nothing like Jesus actually liked Jesus. And that is how people who are nothing like you, and can I say, I know, you're gonna, I'm sure your family across the board, extended family, I'm sure they're nothing like you, right? I'm sure they're all over the place, but they can still like you. And they can still be influenced by you because you take a genuine interest in them. I'm telling you that this is a foolproof principle to being the type of person other people wanna be around. Be a person who takes an interest in the interests of others. And introverts and extroverts, we both have work to do, okay? Introverts, when you enter into a room, you gotta start to work up the nerve to ask questions to others. And I know that's hard. Extroverts, you're on the other side. You gotta work to work up the self-control so you can shut up and let the other person talk, right? Both people have to work on this. I'll tell you, one, one of my goals when I share a meal with someone, and I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm gonna let you in on one of my secrets, okay? Here it is. When I eat a meal with someone, I want to be done first. And not because I'm like scarfing down my food like an animal. I, 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 want, I want to finish my food first because if I do, 
it means my mouth was doing more chewing than talking, right? Which means I was doing more listening. As followers of Jesus, this has to be on our radar. We have to walk towards people. We have to get into the world and you have to take an interest in them. This is the gospel. God walked towards us. He got into our world. He took an interest in us and now we mirror that to the world through our conversations. Do your conversations mirror the gospel to people? Or do they mirror yourself? Verse 16. So look down at your Bible. It says, the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is probably my, my favorite part of the story because it's so like middle school cafeteria, isn't it? Why are you eating with them? That's not the cool table. Why would you sit there? You're with the sinners, you're with the rejects, you're with the losers. This is quintessential self-righteous people. Constantly playing games of who's worthy enough to be in my circle. Who's worthy to be in this picture with me? Who's worthy for my time? And now, okay, I know you don't actually talk like that, but you know what, you think like that? You think like that? If you're, let me put it this way. If your favorite celebrity or maybe your favorite athlete was going to your family gathering this year, Come on, how many of you would be actually be excited to go? Maybe for the first time ever, right? You'd be like, oh my word, they're going to be there. I might not even complain about it. I might even be on time. You'd be excited because they are going to be there. But in reality, let's just be honest, it's just weird Uncle Al, and it's just your clingy cousin, and it's just your mouthy brother. No one's special. That's self-righteousness. That's our operating system, and it's kind of disgusting but we do, we judge a lot of, of, of people through the lens of, okay, are they worthy or not to be in my circle? Do they measure up? This was the Pharisees and the scribes. They're worthy, they're not. These people measure up, well, they, they, these people did measure up, but now they messed up and so now we cancel them. And Jesus comes and says, hey, screw that. I see them, I care about them, I'm walking towards the people you all wanna write off and avoid, I'm going right to them and I'm going to his house. I'm gonna eat with him. I'm gonna party with him. I'm gonna enter into his world so that I can make a difference. Verse 17, when Jesus heard this, so when he heard the Pharisees saying, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? He said, well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Okay, I lied. This is my favorite part of the story, okay? Because I want you to just imagine this. Jesus is at the table with all of these sinners and tax collectors. And then you have a couple religious leaders that they walk by and maybe they, they're outside and they say through the window to the disciples, Psst, hey, why does your rabbi eat with these scum? And Jesus overhears and says, hey, I came for these sick people. Hey, could, could you imagine the table of of tax collectors hearing this. Like, yeah, Pharisees, take that. Wait, what'd you just call us? Wait, you just call us six sinners? That would have been awkward. That would have been straight out of the office, wouldn't it? Like, that's awkward. But this is what Jesus does all the time. A lot of his ministry was pointing out how everybody in some shape or form was a screw up. Everyone has a past. Everyone has dirt. Everyone, to put it in Bible terms, falls short of the glory of God, right? That was Jesus' ministry. And he says, everyone needs another chance. And that's why I came. Do you know, that was Jesus' unhidden agenda. His mission was to seek and save those who knew they needed to be saved. That was his mission. Is that yours? Is that yours? Have you adopted a bigger mission in your life? Because if you want to embrace the awkward, you have to adopt a bigger mission. How many of your missions this year is just to survive? It's just to survive the holidays. You just got to get past the party. You just got to make it through having the in-laws over. You just got to survive. Like that's your, that's your big goal. Or maybe how many of you, your mission is just to build up your platform? Right, you, you gotta build up your name, your reputation. You gotta get people more interested in you. And I get it. I get the temptation. But Jesus is calling us to surrender those missions because they're gonna drive you mad. They're, they're gonna leave just this small, tiny imprint in the world. And I know you're craving more. 
You're craving significance. That's a good thing. You know that? God made you to be significant. Don't, that's not a bad thing. Don't feel bad for that. The way we usually go after significance is usually the bad thing. The way we, we, we get significance is by embracing the awkward. It's by changing lives. It's by entering into people's mess and into their stories and saying, hey, guess what? I love you. So does God. There's a savior and there's hope for you. Jesus is offering you a different Christmas. He is. He's offering you a different life. Jesus says that if you're following me, you're going to do more than just survive. You're going to do something bigger than just impress others. You're going to embrace my bigger mission. Those people that you want to avoid, those parties, those conversations, that that awkwardness, you have to start seeing those messes as an opportunity. Because each mess, that's now your mission. That's your mission. That you're the family member now, you're the coworker now, you're the friend now who's gonna break the pattern of awkwardness and you're going to walk towards those who need it. I want you to take an interest in those you deem uninteresting and then I want you to show them the grace and truth of Jesus because that's exactly what he did for us, what he did for you. That's where he went. He went into the awkward and as we follow, that's where we're going to do, go to. I gotta tell you one of my favorite stories. One of my favorite stories, it's about Woody Hayes. You ever heard of this guy? He died about five years before I was born. Uh, he was the coach uh, for Ohio State football, known to be a very fiery guy, very charismatic type of guy, a little bit of Bobby Knight kind of guy in him. I think that's actually what got him fired. Uh, the Gator Bowl of 1978, it was Ohio State versus Clemson. And with less than five minutes left on the clock, Ohio State was trailing 17 to 15. But they had the ball within an opportunity to score. And unfortunately, the, the QB, after marching down the field, he throws an interception that, to the defensive nose tackle. The nose tackle goes, takes it, touchdown. He's now the hero of the Gator Bowl. And he goes and he runs out of bounds near Coach Woody. And then Woody comes barreling, barreling over and he just takes a swing at the guy. A fight broke out. Players are holding their own coach back from throwing more punches. In Ohio State, they walked into their locker room visibly upset, not just by the loss, but even just by the way their coach handled the whole situation. It was a mess. It was terrible. The coach was immediately fired. And of course, the, the, me, the media had a field day investigating, you know, reporting on how toxic Woody, Coach Woody Hayes was. Former players who didn't like him were interviewed. They're calling him a terrible leader. He's mean. They're glad he's gone. So rightfully so, the disgraced Woody Hayes, he retreats from the spotlight. Right? He gets himself out of there. He secluded himself. And the Hayes family started to live in infamy. That is until Coach Landry got involved. Coach Landry was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Beloved coach, committed Christian, polar opposite really of Woody Hayes. Woody was fiery, charismatic, temper. Coach Landry, he was chill, even keeled. He was hard to rattle. And at the end of that same football season, Coach Landry, he was invited to this big banquet with all these other successful coaches and well-known athletes. Every year, normally, Landry would appear at this banquet with his wife. And just like everyone else who attended that event. But this time, Landry didn't show up with his wife. Instead, Tom walked in the door with none other than the disgraced Woody Hayes. <laughs> the looks he got. You can imagine. The silence that fell on that room. Tom Landry made that banquet awkward. Later, when he was asked, uh, why'd you do it? Why would you take Woody Hayes? Landry said this. He said, well, I figured since everyone else was beating up on Woody, someone needed to show him something different. Of course, everyone had an opinion. Reporters attacking Landry for his lack of judgment. Surely a coach wouldn't do this. She should make better decisions. Landry's public image actually took a hit because of this. Yet still, Tom Landry's friendship helped lift Woody Hayes out of his shame and silence his tormentors. Sounds a bit like what Jesus did for Matthew, doesn't it? Sounds a bit like what Jesus did for you. Sounds a bit like what Jesus did for me. And now Jesus asks us, and he says, hey, I want you to go now, and I want you to do this for others. You have that Woody Hayes family, family member. 
You have that Woody Hayes coworker, acquaintance, whatever it is. They're difficult. They're, they're selfish. Their reputation is deserved. And Jesus, right now, tonight, is calling you to walk towards that mess, to take an interest, a genuine interest in them, and to adopt a bigger mission that will leave a bigger impact in this world. And so what? Who do you need to walk towards this Christmas season? Who has God placed in your mind right now? You had them throughout this entire sermon, the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you know who this is. It's this person that you've been avoiding. It's this person that you just don't click with. It's this person that you really hope doesn't show up. That's the person that he wants you to take an interest in this year. Who does God wanna use you to influence? I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a minute. I want you to ask God, say, God, who do I need to walk towards? God, I want you to start to prepare my heart. I want you to start to prepare my mind so that when I see them, I'm not seeing them how the rest of the world sees them. I'm not seeing them as a traitor. I'm not seeing them as a sellout. I'm not seeing them as this selfish, terrible person. I'm seeing them how Jesus saw Matthew. I'm seeing them as someone who, who needs another chance. I'm seeing them as someone who's hurt. I'm seeing them as someone who I can make a huge impact and difference in their life. I want you to take a minute. I want you to pray and ask God. God, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you that you walked towards our mess, that you took an interest in us, that you gave your life up and then called us just like you called Peter, just like you called John, just like you called Matthew. You call us to come to you and to adopt that same mission. You call us to lay down our lives for the sake of other people, to seek and save the lost. God, I do pray for every single person in here who has that Woody Hayes, who has that Matthew, who has that fam family member that they've struggled with, that they've been hurt by, that they've been let down by. God, I do pray that your spirit work in their heart and that even they, they can walk out of here excited and ready for the challenge to walk right into that awkward and say, I'm gonna take an interest. One step at a time, I'm going to make a difference by loving this person because God, we have been loved by you. You are good, you are worthy, we love you. We thank you for this time where we can be reminded. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.